page or website, and uh, you can uh, play catch up and listen to a tremendous word that Malachi brought and his wonderful wife, beautiful wife, Faith. Man, what a time, and thank you, sir, for enriching us yesterday. Who was here yesterday? Man, it was a, it was a blessed time. Christ lives in us. Jesus possesses us. And, um, you know, it was a great opportunity to sow into his ministry, their ministry, uh, yesterday. And those who are believing to, uh, to do things for God, I believe that ought to be everyone. Amen. Uh, you, still, um, you still have an opportunity to, to, to sow into someone else's ministry. See, you know, we have opportunities to be left, right, and center to sow into other people's lives and ministries in preparation for what God is willing to get done in ours. But uh, we were so blessed yesterday. Father, we thank you for this time today. We want to thank you for every family here and this, this new academic uh, season that is about to begin. And Lord, just this latter part of this year, Lord, you said the latter shall be former than the, the, the latter is, former than the, is better than the former. And Father, we just embrace that. We thank you, Lord, for progress, for brighter and brighter. In the name of Jesus, new levels. We say, rise up. We say, rise up. In the name of Jesus. We speak that out in the atmosphere. And Father, we thank you that through and by your spirit, there is elevation taking place, promotion taking place, increase taking place. In the matchless name of Jesus. And everybody said... Amen, amen. I want to uh, welcome those on live stream. Church, can you help me welcome those also? Thank you for joining us far and wide, wherever it may be. I believe that uh, our God, the God who we serve, he knows no limits. Amen. And so he can touch you as he's touching us here. I believe that as I speak, the Holy Spirit really is going to take those words and land them right in your heart and your life will never be the same again. Amen. Turn your Bibles, please, this morning. Thank you, Tunday. Bless you, sir. Um, Haggai chapter 2, verses 9. I'm going to read this. Uh, we came to, we came leaping. We came into church walking and leaping and praising the Lord. Amen. <laughs> oh, who, who did that this morning? Walked in, leaped in, and praised the Lord. <laughs> Can you demonstrate how you did it, please, somebody? Oh, Pastor, I'm not wearing the shoes for that. Well, hey, listen. All things are possible with the Holy Ghost. Amen. Hey, look at this. Haggai, chapter 2, chapter two verses uh, 9. It says, The glory of this latter ha- uh, temple. I started last week's message um, with this passage. The glory of this latter temple shall be greater. Someone say greater. greater. Than the former says the Lord of hosts. And in this place, some say right here, right now, in this place, right here, right now, come on now, right here, right now, in this place, in this place, I will give peace, says the Lord of hosts. Verse 10, hallelujah. On the 24th day of the ninth month in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to Haggai the prophet saying, thus says the Lord, Hallelujah. Am I wanting to read that? No. Praise the Lord. Uh, verses, I was wanting to read verses um, uh, 7. Look at this. Oh, glory to God. Verse 6, in fact. Thus says the Lord of hosts, once more, I will shake heaven, and I will shake the earth. I will shake the sea and the dry land. Basically, anything that can be shaken will be shaken. And I will shake all the nations. All nations, can you see that happening? Nations are being shaken, even today, even right now. Nations shaken politically. Things are shaken into position. Things are lining up, praise the Lord, uh, for the glorious, and it is, the glorious return of Jesus. You and I have this glorious responsibility to usher in the King of Kings. It's a greater honor than the former prophets who ushered in the first coming. We get to usher in his second coming. And he said that even the desire of all nations is going to be shaken. And I will fill the temple with glory, says the Lord of hosts, who believes this. 
Hallelujah. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. Then I read what we just read earlier. I'm going to read it again. The glory of this latter temple shall be greater than the former. And in this place, I will give peace. Notice that. In the midst of great shaking, in the midst of great uh, rumors and actual wars, there shall be peace for those who know that they are not only in the temple, but they are the temple of the Holy Ghost in which the glory resides. Someone say peace. peace. Perfect peace. Perfected peace. Hallelujah. Secured in Jesus. Hallelujah. So no matter what is taking place, there is peace promised. And there is protection promised. Hallelujah. And they were the words that were ringing all the week before I came back and couldn't get away from it Saturday night. And I knew I had to minister on the keeper and being kept and being protected. And you know, because you were here last week, for those who were here, here last week, then great. If not, you can catch up if you haven't already. And these, these, these thoughts and these, I believe, Holy Ghost-inspired thoughts were flooded into my heart uh, pertaining to weapons. And I want to talk about protective weapons today. Because we have a problem, pro- covenant of peace and a promise of being kept by the caretaker and the keeper, amen, and protected by the Prince of Peace, the protector, Jesus, the righteous, amen. Man, I, it's good news to know that we're protected. I said it's good news. Yes. Hallelujah. I tell you, your family, your life will shine brighter. The glory shall be seen. It shall be better than any former displays of his glory. So much so that it will provoke people. Woo, come on, the rain is falling. Come on, greater rain. Heavier showers of God's glory. Woo, ha, ha, ha. It will provoke Israel. It will provoke the Jews to ask questions. What is it? What is it that you're doing? Because we know this that we see upon you comes from the, the, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They can discern it. But what are you doing to tap that which we seemingly can't? And we say, the way is Jesus. Provocation. Some say, I'm going to be used to provoke. Hallelujah. He said the silver's mine, the gold is mine. He, he said that in context of talking about the glory of the Lord. Hallelujah. Being protected from any kind of financial crisis. I'm glad I'm in Christ. Amen. Amen. See, yesterday, David Hathaway, he was talking and obviously leading the National Day of uh, Prayer in London, Wembley Arena, and he was, he was talking with one of the uh, facilitators in prayer. He was, they were talking about how we, we as a nation got to declare it, that we are not in crisis. You know, those who, who are here, amen, and are filled with the Holy Ghost are in Christ. Amen. amen. And we influence a nation in the right way, right out of crisis. Right into victory in the name of Jesus. Oh, glory to God. Look at uh, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12 here. It says, For this reason I also suffer, suffer these things. Nevertheless, I will not be sh- ashamed. Hallelujah. He said, For I know whom I have believed. How many know it's time to have a personal relationship with the Lord? To know in whom the one who you confess that you have faith in. It's time for you to know him more intimately. Become more and more intimately acquainted with him. Not only knowing him, but knowing the power of his resurrection. Paul said it, you know, that I I press to know the power of his resurrection. We'll get onto some of those things maybe in a little bit. He said, I know in whom I have believed, and I am persuaded I am sure, hallelujah, that he is able to keep that which I commit unto him. So he don't keep everything. He keeps that which I commit to him. So if I can commit my family to him, man, he, he, he keeps that. He keeps my family. If I commit my finances to him, he keeps that. If I commit my body, my health to him. 
He keeps my body free from sickness and disease. Never will sickness and disease be something that, uh, uh, that dominates you. Sickness and disease is something that you dominate. In the name of Jesus. Jesus said, lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. That is dominion speaking. He said, not only will you uh, not have to endure sickness riddling and running through your body, but you will annihilate it by laying hands on those in whom sickness and the spur of infirmity is invaded and trespassed into. You and your hands will remove it. That's dominion. Hallelujah. Those things that we commit to the Lord. Hallelujah. He will, glory to God. Keep. Now we got glorious scriptures like Romans chapter 8, uh, verses 28, which talks about all things work together for good for those who love. See, it's for, for, it is for a specific bunch of people. All things work together, not for everybody, but for all those who love God. Hallelujah. All things, I mean, every aspect of your life working together for good. For, for good. You, you, know, you don't have to you know, have heightened uh, discernment uh, levels to know what is good and what is bad. Amen? Amen? Everything working together for good, that is the person who loves God. That is that man's portion, that woman's portion. Amen? Well, Jesus amplified this thought in uh, John's Gospel, the 14th chapter. He talked about this in verse 23. He said, those that love me shall keep my word. So if you love him, you do what he says. If you don't love him, you don't do what he says. (laughs) It's really really simple, you know. It's not really hard for these things to understand, but the enemy's uh, trying to make it difficult for us to understand, to cause blockages from the word from landing in your heart. But how many know it's time for us to, to really make those deposits and make them sure? Amen. Why are we too, we're too quiet this morning? Amen. Man, praise the Lord. I should have brought my tambourine this morning. <laughs> <laughs> or a color, more colorful jacket or something. But anyhow, praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Who loves him today? The proof of your love is your action and your obedience. What you do, that word came strong last week. If you really just do what you know to do. Yeah, you know what to do, just do it. And when you do it, you prove your love. And when you walk in love and adoration with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with everything that's in you, you love him with all your might, praise the Lord. You love him with everything that you've got. When you do, I'm telling you, everything works together for good. There is peace. There is protection. It, this is you tapping. Well, we've been set and liberated from the, from the curse of the law and all those laws of the Old Testament. Yeah, but there are, there are governing spiritual laws that govern, govern this, 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 this grace that we have. The royal law of love. Hallelujah which is loving him and then loving others. Hallelujah. The royal law, of, the, the, the law of faith, the law of seed time and harvest, glory to God. There is laws. There is a law that sets us free from the law of sin and death. It's called the law of the spirit of life found in Christ Jesus. What does that look like? How do you work that law? Well, you remain abiding in him, keeping his words abiding richly in you, hallelujah, because his words aren't normal words. His words are spirit and life. So that's how you work that law. Amen. How do you work the the law of faith? Well, uh, you believe and you speak and you act in accordance to what you see in the word. Amen. I ain't got time to unlock all of that, but praise the Lord. Someone say peace. Peace. Protection. Protection. He's my caretaker. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's just uh, look, look at 2 Corinthians chapter, chapter 10 this morning. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Hallelujah. Someone say protective weapons. You know, my, my endeavor as a pastor is to arm you, to make you 
uh, armed and dangerous as you go out of this place, amen, not only um, take ground personally, but to annihilate any fortresses built by the enemy and opposing spirits, amen, uh, that are trying to stop the advancement of the gospel. Uh, we want to be armed and dangerous. <laughs> amen, there's a nation to win. There's people who desperately need our faith. Hallelujah. Uh, here, uh, it's going to tell us something in verse, verse 4. For the weapons of our warfare are not physical, not carnal. These weapons are not uh, weapons of flesh and of blood, but they are mighty. Hallelujah. The weapons we have, yeah, protective weapons. But these are mighty weapons before God for the overthrow and destruction of strongholds. Hallelujah. Mighty weapons. Someone say mighty weapons. Mighty, mighty weapons. How many in here have ever been in a fight? Or how many know that there are such things called, you know, um, the, 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 I'm not talking about a, a fist fight. Praise the Lord. <laughs> I don't want to admit that. That was my old man who's dead and buried, so he's gone. Um, so <laughs> I've been hit before. Um, but I turn the other cheek, you know. Uh, <laughs> we fight battles, don't we? Battles rage. How many realize we fight battles? How many know there is a battle called the, uh, the, the fight of faith? Amen. Uh, how many perhaps there's people in this room going through a battle right now? Has anyone won a battle before? Come on, anyone got a victory before? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We're victorious. Amen. Um, if you haven't seen a victory in a long time, you've got to ask the question, why? Perhaps you're not using these mighty weapons. Because these weapons overthrow. These weapons don't just protect you from great devastation. They don't just protect you from being destroyed. These weapons destroy that it's trying to destroy. So, someone work with me today. Just an amen or something. Amen. Just a yes. These weapons are mighty. Maybe, and I think for a long time, when you get around church people, um, you, can, uh, you, you can see that, man, this individual, they've been, they've been shooting blanks for far too long. You know, they may have the form, they may have the rifle, but they're not shooting the right caliber bullet. Yeah. It's like in the bush, you know, uh, I was reminded of some of these things because, you know, your, um, your sister, she was posting some things, um, you know, on her, on her social media from the cow ranch where Evie was raised, eight miles from the nearest town. And, of course, you've got black bears, you've got... Uh, you got grizzlies, and this is, this is a beast. And if you went out there, um, and you only, you've got to understand, you've got one opportunity with a, with, a, with a grizzly bear charging you. You've got one opportunity. You've got one moment, come on now, to pull the trigger. And if you have got a 22 caliber uh, uh, pistol, then I'm telling you, you are just going to hit that thing and just make it irritated. That's all you're going to do. It's like it's you like slapping it in its face. It's not, you're not annihilating it. You're just making it mad. You're going to make it so mad as it rips your, your, your flesh apart. Come on, you need a, you need a 416 uh, uh, Rigby, or you need something that is going to annihilate this thing. You understand what I mean? You've got to have enough power in that thing. You need, to have, you need to put enough punch in that weapon whereby it destroys it so that it doesn't destroy you. <laughs> but if you get the wrong caliber gun, I'm telling you, you're finished. But we have a covenant of protection, so we can speak to that thing, too. Amen. Amen. <laughs> but you understand what I'm trying to uh, illustrate here. Thank you, Holy Ghost. 
So we've got, we've got to use the weapons we have. Well, we've got to know about them. Amen. Never forget the first time when I, when I, uh, <laughs> the first time when I went to the ranch. And, of course, I was, you know, pursuing Evie. And uh, Evie's, Evie's father, he gave me, he just handed me a, a, like a rifle. And I'm like a European, you know. So I'm like thinking, oh, my days. Is this, is, this is what they call a rifle. I've seen these in the films, you know. And so... Um, when my future father-in-law was outside, I just passed it back to my future wife and said, please protect me here. He said, that dangerous. True story. I gave it right back to her. He said, you, you, you know what you're doing. I don't. <laughs> I've since learned, praise the Lord. Um, but the weapons we have pack enough power to punch the enemy and destroy him. I'm going to read, I'm going to read this. Verse 4, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God. For the pulling down of strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ, and being ready to punish, verse 6, all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. And that's something. These weapons work when you are walking in obedience. And being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Hallelujah. And so one of the first weapons I'm going to get into in a moment is holiness. It's holiness. I'm going to read it from the Amplified. It says, from, from the Amplified here, it says, For the weapons of our warfare are not physical. Weapons of flesh and blood, but they are mighty before God for the overthrow and destruction of strongholds inasmuch as we refute arguments and theories, theories and reasonings and every proud and lofty thing that sets itself up against the true knowledge of God. And we lead every, every, someone say thought and purpose away captive into the obedience of Christ, the Messiah the anointed one. Everyone say this. Taking captive every thought. Pulling down strongholds. Well, you know, you've got to understand, you know, there's strongholds in our region and, you know, there's things that we have to, you know, really, um, you know, use our authority against. Yeah, there is. There's many demonic spirits, but Paul here wasn't talking about things flowing, flowing around in the spiritual realm. He was talking about thoughts. He was talking about he was talk, he was talking about strongholds, reasonings, and theories. You hear me? Now I'm not talking about yeah. We deal with territorial spirits. Oh yeah, yeah, we do. But you can't deal with the territorial spirit when you haven't pulled down theories and thought processes and things that are going on not above your head, but in your head. Yeah. Someone tell me, uh, where are thoughts? Do they hover over your head or are they in you? Yeah. You hear me? Yeah. What about imaginations? What about reasonings? Hallelujah. The Bible talks about casting down imaginations. Imaginations. That's in the head. This is why you can have two people in the same region where those, you know, um, the, those regional demonic spirits are, are doing whatever they're trying to do, yet you've got one in victory and one in defeat. Yet the same spirits are around in that atmosphere. Why? Because one has dealt with the imagination's reasonings and strongholds, and one hasn't. You hear me? Oh, my. Whew. Once again, answer the question, is it something over your head or in the head? The person who always thinks it's over the head, it's always over the head. It's, all, it's always overwhelming. But really, it's something that they've got to deal with here. And the Bible says, and Paul said, you've got given uh, weapons to mighty weapons. And I'm excited. Because I'm tired. The reason why I'm excited, I'm not just excited to teach and give revelation. I'm excited because I, we put this stuff into practice. Who puts this stuff into practice? Who's wanting to? Come on, who's wanting to? 
Amen. Casting down. Casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience, to the obedience of Christ. He wasn't talking about taking devils captive, was he? <laughs> we cast out devils. We don't take take them captive. You know where we're going to put them in the basement, or you know where, where, what do we do when we take them captive? We deal with devils. We, we refute and re- drive de- de- demonic spirits out of the territory in which we have jurisdiction. But this is dealing with, come on somebody, who wants it? we want the word, don't we? This is dealing with something that's not over you, but something that's trying to get in. See, it's like the parable of the, the, the sower. You know, there's four types of seed. And uh, we see that if the enemy can't snatch it from the ground, then if he can't get it out of your heart, he'll try and get something in your heart to choke it. So these strongholds are something that is in the head that needs to be arrested and dealt with and slapped down, like Brother Keith Moore says. He says, slap it down. Slap it down in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. You sell it once and for all. This first thought is the devil is defeated. Christianity is all about Jesus Causing the enemy to be under your feet. He's under your feet. Who is? The devil. Then he empowered you to trample upon the enemy. And, and Malachi said it uh, in, I believe, chapter 4, verse 4, or maybe chapter 3. He said, in the last days, that the enemy shall be trampled under your feet like dust. Come on, we crush serpents and scorpions. And see, he's talking about the devil. So if the boss of all inferior fallen spirits, the boss of all, all inferior spirits is under your feet, why are you concerned about the, if the boss is under your feet of the demonic spirits, why are you concerned about all those other devils and demons? When the boss of those inferior spirits are, is under your foot, Woo. The enemy don't fight on our level. You understand? We've got mighty weapons. I know I'm loud this morning, but praise the Lord. Come on now. Set an Amandora for this. And we've got the power of the Holy Ghost, and we've got the helper, and the one who's training us and showing us and revealing things. And, uh, he gave us a promise, wherever we go, he shall be with us. Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. The devil isn't omnipresent. The devil himself is not omnipresent. He don't he don't live. I I could I I I don't believe he lives in Bolton. I don't believe the devil. Now there is demonic spirits in Bolton, as there is in Manchester. I just don't believe he lives in Bolton, though. I don't believe he even lives in Manchester. Yeah, but the devil rocked up in my, my, my apartment, you know, the other night. Listen, was it really the devil? Maybe it was like a two-foot, inferior, blind in both eyes, deaf in both ears, paralyzed from the neck down, little inferior devil. You know, people... <laughs> It's like when uh, Lester Summerall, he was in Tibet ministering. You know, these guys understood, these generals understood their authority. And we've got to understand our authority. We've got to understand the place of the enemy. And uh, <clears throat> he was ministering out there in Tibet and, you know, uh, advancing the kingdom and doing what the Lord told him to do. And, of course, you're going to have demonic spirits that... Um, you know, that, that are going to try and interfere with the plan of God because they want to stop and hinder. But a man or a woman who understands their authority, you know, will prevent the hindrances of demonic forces. And uh, so he got woken up in, in the middle of the night and, um, and, a, and an evil spirit had moved, some, some devils had moved his bed from one side of the room to the other. So he woke up and thought, Move it back right now in Jesus' name. He thought, man, I'm not going to, you know, use my energy to, use, uh, to push my bed back. 
He said, devil, you move my bed right back. They were just demons. They weren't. It wasn't the devil. But as Smith, he, Smith Willsworth, he was talking about another situation where he was ministering. And uh, one night, um, he, how he recalls the situation, he said the devil showed up in his bedroom. And he woke up, and the enemy was trying to instill fear. And he, he said, oh, it's only you, and went back to sleep. I wonder what the response of the end, or what the devil was. <laughs> this guy knows something. <laughs> Let's get out. This woman knows something. Come on. I can't leave this person alone. They know they've got mighty weapons. And they've dealt with the thought process, the reasonings, and the theories that would try and suggest that you can't handle the enemy. Oh, man. Come on. Just one believer who understands that the spirit of the living God lives on the inside of them. Come on. And understands that they've been given the name, the name of Jesus. Oh, come on now. And there isn't a higher name than the name of Jesus. And every knee will bow to the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Some say, he's under my feet. Christianity is all about Jesus causing the enemy to be under your feet. Come on, stomp your feet. Stomp, come on, stomp your feet. That's the sound of the mighty army of God marching forward in victory, understanding their authority in Jesus. Under. He's under your feet. In the name of Jesus. Oh, glory to God. Hallelujah. So, you know, some people are legends in their own eyes, you know. I remember when I was in Bible school, you know, we were out preaching and, and doing all kinds of stuff. And, and uh, every day I would go out, find, find, find the sick, and we'd, we'd like, rip people out of wheelchairs. And, you know, we did crazy things. And we went to the airport, ministering to people as they come and as they go. And I remember one night we just, we, we really just cranked it up and we committed as, a, as just a few friends in Bible school just to, just to keep on doing what we're doing. I remember that night, just a, just a real, I got woken up in the middle of the night, just an evil spirit, you know, just in the room. I could reach out, if you will, I could, it's as if I could reach out and touch it. You know what I mean? When you just know, whoo, it's there. Couldn't see anything, but I, it was, and I tried to speak, and I couldn't speak. And then this, this like, uh, as if it was a fist, just hit me right in the chest here. Right in the church, it was a physical demonstration. I'm not glorifying him. But it was a physical um, experience, yet a spiritual one too. And I was, I was just, I knew what I needed to do, just confess the name of Jesus. But I know what the devil was trying to do, instill fear. And I tell you what, it was as if my, my jaw was locked. I couldn't see nothing. And I just got a J out. And it boom came boom right off. I went, Jesus! Woo! And the spirit of joy and faith invaded that whole space. I started praying in the Holy Ghost. I tell you what, the one an ounce of fear. And and but but I it was as if I heard, I didn't hear it audibly, but I heard, heard the evil spirit say, if you keep on doing what you're doing, I will torment you. And I said, I said, devil. And I thought it was the devil. It wasn't. It wasn't the devil. It was just a demon spirit. I said, there, in, that, in that case, you, your tactics don't work on me. I'm going to up it. I'm going to preach the gospel everywhere I go. You don't scare me in the name of Jesus. You can't come anywhere close to me. And he never did. We dealt with it. A friend of mine, you know, he, he around the same time, the next morning at uh, Bible school, he said, he said, hey, were you all right last night? I said, well, well tell me, like, why? why are you asking the question? He said, I got woken up and I started praying for somebody and, and, uh, and I tried to pray for, you know, I just knew I had to pray. There was a burden on me to pray. And so I started praying and I thought I was supposed to pray for so-and-so. And so I started praying for so-and-so. But I knew instantly when, when I started praying for him, I wasn't supposed to pray for them. And so I asked the Lord, how many know that's a good thing? Yeah. That's a good thing to do. Just ask the Lord, yeah. what is it that you want me to pray about? Yes. Don't just pray. Ask the Lord what to pray about. And so the Lord put 
You are my heart last night. This is, what, this is what he said. So I started praying, and it was around that whole time. That's so why I was just praying in the Holy Ghost. I said, the devil showed up in my room. It wasn't the devil. <laughs> it wasn't the enemy. It was, a, it was a demonic spirit, though. Hallelujah. The devil's not omnipresent. I'm going to read this from the, uh, the Passion Translation. It's for, it says, for although we, have, we live in the natural realm. I don't know we live in a natural realm. We're not ignoring that. We don't wage a military campaign employing human weapons. We don't use manipulation to achieve our aims. Instead, our spiritual weapons are energized. Notice this. Our spiritual weapons are energized with divine power to effectively dismantle the defenses behind which people hide. Because the enemy works through people a lot of times. We're not destroying or demolishing the people, but the spirits, the deceptive uh, things. Amen. Verse 5, we can demolish every deceptive fantasy that opposes God and break through every arrogant attitude that is raised up in defiance of the true knowledge of God. We capture, like prisoners of war, every thought and insist that it bows in obedience to the anointed one. Since we are armed with such dynamic weaponry, we stand ready to punish any trace of rebellion. As soon as you choose complete, someone say, complete obedience. Complete obedience. Woo, this is a good word. Yes. Someone say, I'm power-assisted. Power assisted. Power assisted. Come on, you, you, I remember even talking about Bible school. Remember you, the fox that you drove? The VW fox. It must have been older than my grandmother. I don't know. I mean, it was an old car, you know? And... Uh, it, yeah, it had carpet. It was one of those cars. I mean, they carpeted the dashboard. Whoa. I mean, it was, it was special, this thing. I mean, but you were never tempted to move in. It was one of those cars. We, we endeavored to try and go down to uh, Texas that time, and we uh, broke down. Praise the Lord. <laughs> the fox had never made it that far on the highway. But anyway, um, it didn't have power steering. And um, I had a uh, Mitsubishi Eclipse, but Evie, you know, recently got given this, <laughs> this BW, so we, we wanted to use this uh, car and just, you know, drive it a little bit. Uh, but it never made it to Texas, so our friends had to come up from Texas, uh, from Dallas, to come and see us, and that was a great time. But anyhow, uh, it didn't have power sit steering. And so uh, driving her car and driving my, my, my car, which had power steering, there was a massive differentiation. Uh, let me say there is a bigger gap and a bigger differentiation between you using these mighty weapons he's given you and you using your own strength. It, once again, if there is struggle after struggle, it's like, I just can't turn the corner. I just can't see this thing turning. I'm breaking a sweat every time. Are you shooting a 22 caliber trying to knock down this bear. Are you hearing me? Yeah. Because how many know the thoughts, theories, and reasonings can be fierce yeah. in the soul realm? Come on, somebody. Yeah. But he said, Whew, we have mighty weapons. Our weapons are weapons that are filled weapons. Power-filled weapons, able to destroy any setup and any fortress the enemy has built. Oh, glory to God. The weapons we have are power-filled weapons, able to demolish every strong place of the devil, every strong place of the enemy. Jordan's translation says this, we do not fight on the level of this world. Woo, come on now. We don't fight on the level of this world. You know, when you, when you see people, you know, uh, like on Instagram and stuff, and they've got a picture of Jesus at the table arm wrestling the devil, and you, got, you, know, you can see Jesus' bicep way bigger, and he's clearly winning. You know, I, I get it. You know, 
But, but listen, you, he, the devil can't pull up a chair at the, seat, at the table where Jesus sits. He's not on his level. It would be a mighty promotion to stare the enemy in the eyes because he's under your feet. He's not eye level with the believer. Are you kidding me? He's under your feet. The enemy is. You gain that perspective. It'll change everything. It'll change how you speak. It'll change how you, you, you see situations. Come on, the spirit of death is under our feet. It's under your foot. Sickness, disease, spirit of infirmity is under our feet. They, they're associated linked spirits to the boss of those spirits who is under your feet. Oh, spirit of poverty. Whew, come on now. Spirit of poverty works for the chief demon who's under your foot. Whew. So there's mighty, mighty power filled weapons. So the answer is okay, if there's these things available, like Evie was saying, uh, we, we've got to gain access, entry to this power. Amen. Real quick, 2 Kings. Anyone happy? Anyone full of the joy of the Lord? That's a better thing. Better than happiness. Happiness fluctuates. I was happy to see my team winning 1-0 and then my happiness fluctuated a little bit yesterday. Look at this, 2 Kings. This is a situation where a lady has a husband and, uh, who, is, who has died. It's a devastating time for her. She's... She's in a situation where not only has her husband left and departed, but he's also left a great uh, debt. And so the creditors are coming, knocking on her door, asking her uh, to pay up. So she's scrambling, trying to figure out how she's going to pay all the debts. Uh, They're coming for everything she owes, including her sons, because they're endeavoring to use the sons as slaves to pay off the debt. Now, how many know this is, um, you know this is a desperate situation for this lady? She needs the power of God. She needs the power of God. And let me say it this way. Everyone in this room needs the power of God. Whether your husband's still with you, your wife's still with you, whether you're in debt or not, everyone, unless you are living in carnality and your plans are natural plans, if they're natural plans, then go ahead and try and make it happen in, in the natural. But it won't really give much glory to the Lord. It's just really a pride mission to accomplish that which you believe you can do. What about, I tell you what, a sign of maturity is who do you turn to most? Is it your ability or the help that comes from God? That's a sign of maturity. Your ability, or do you turn to the help he's given? That's a massive, ma- massive sign of maturity. When bad news comes, do you, are you instantly in a state of fret and concern, worry, thinking about what you can do? Or do you lean immediately and think of the power of God? Sign of maturity. It's a gauge. It's a gauge. So this lady, she needs the power of God. Like everyone else, everyone here needs the power of God. And so the prophet Elisha said to her, what, uh, sorry, so Elisha said to her, knowing the context which I've just shared, what shall I do for you? Tell me, what do you have in the house? And she said, your maidservant has nothing in the house. Notice she, she did have something, but she called it nothing. That's most uh, that, that's, that's the problem for most people. What they do have on board, they, 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 they don't esteem it. They don't value it. See, Jesus understood that God can use nothing. God can use the fragments from a, from a little boy and turn it into just a huge display of God's bounty and feed thousands of people with 12 baskets full remaining. Hallelujah. Well, your maidservant has nothing uh, in the house but a, jar of, but a jar of oil. Verse 3 says, Then he said, Go, borrow vessels from everywhere, from all your neighbors, empty vessels. Empty, uh, you go ahead and get it, as many empty vessels as you can. 
do not gather just a few. So what God was doing here was God was meeting this woman at her own level of expectation. So depending on how many uh, vessels she was about to bring had a, had a bearing, a complete accurate bearing to what God could do. And just like God met her at her level of expectation, God will meet you at your level of expectation too. Hallelujah. Now, oil throughout the scriptures is symbolic of the power of God. It's symbolic of the, the, the grace of God. It's symbolic of the person of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And see here, we see this. Let's read verses 4. And when you have come in, you shall shut the door behind you and your, and your sons. Then pour it, the small little jar of oil that she had. You pour that, pour that into all the other vessels. It's like, what? Like, this is going to fill all the vessels? No chance. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like you got a little bit of war here, and we get as many vessels as we can fill the whole, uh, the whole stage here, and, and then we get a word. Go ahead with this and fill all of them with what you got in your hand. Oh, that's not possible. Well, see, even if we make it to this point where we've obeyed God and done what he said and got all the vessels and then God gives you a word like that, go ahead and fill them all. You're like, not possible. It's a mindset. It's a reasoning. It's a reasoning. Most people stop there because it's like, all right, I see the next move. But, but, but God, I also... Uh, have determined in my mental faculties that your next move is to give me enough oil because I clearly haven't got enough here in my hand so that I can go ahead and do your next move that you've given, uh, given me to do. It don't work, work that way. I said it don't work that way. Oh my. <laughs> can I read on a little bit? Verse 5. So when she went from him and shut the door behind her and her sons who brought the vessels to her, and she poured it out, she started pouring it. She's doing well, isn't she? She didn't wait for more oil. She's pouring. Now it came to pass. Ooh, glory. (laughs) Now it came to pass when the vessels were full, vessels that were bigger than the little, little pot that she had, that she said to her son, bring me another vessel. And he said to her, there is not another vessel. So the oil ceased. Now, oil symbolizes the power of God. Come on now. The, come on now, you got to see this. The power of God is flowing out as long as God has something to fill into. As soon as she had nothing more to fill into, the power, the flow of God's power stopped. So you want the power? What have you got for the power to flow into? You've got to do something. You've got to expect and get some vessels out so that God can Fill it. When the right time comes, you know, somebody in this church is going to give the testimony. But I heard it yesterday, and I was speaking to this uh, gentleman on the phone uh, quite a bit about property acquisitions. And, and he was with his wife, just, you know, just, man, they, they, they didn't necessarily have all the money together. They had some, but they didn't have all the money together to, to, to get this property and uh, to do what the Lord has been impressing in the heart to do, and that is to become a house owner, praise the Lord. And the Lord's doing it. He's doing it in many, many lives, praise the Lord. And we ought to get more testimonies up here to share because that's the season we're in, praise the Lord. And so uh, they, they were doing viewings, right? <laughs> and uh, stepping out and seeing the place, the see, you know, places that seem right to them. And just, you know, out of, out of nowhere, Spirit of the Lord inspires somebody from, you know, a different part of the world to just say, hey, listen, you know, we... 
you know, we know your situation, moved, uh, moved to do something for you, and, you know, I don't know how much you need, but this is what I have, and I'm going to send it your way, and it, it was exactly what they need, needed. But do you know what they were doing? They were, they were getting vessels out. They were digging ditches so that the power could, could flow. Soon as the last vessel was filled, the oil stopped. What if they had 10 more pots? It would keep on flowing. So who wants the power of God? Where's your pot? Where's your vessels? Where's, are you digging ditches or not? So we're talking about these mighty, 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 mighty powerful weapons and power that is available unto us. But there has to be something called corresponding action in Jesus' precious name. I'm going to give you this first weapon, and then we're going to look at some other weapons uh, next week. Amen. Because I'm running out of time here. Number one. Someone say number one. Holiness is a weapon. Woo! Ephesians chapter 6, verse 14, from the, the Passion Translation, it says, Put on truth as a belt to strengthen you to stand in triumph. Put on holiness. Someone say, put on holiness. Put it up on the screen, guys, for, for, for the church to see the Passion Translation, if we can. Put on holiness, it reads, as the protective armor that covers your heart. Someone say, the protective armor. Has God given us a covenant of peace? In the midst of everything being shaken, has he promised peace? Has he given us a promise that we shall not be shaken? Everything that we commit to him shall be kept. Have we got that promise? Come on, have we got 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 5, where it says his power shall keep us? Yeah, we got it. His power shall keep us. Keep us. Have we got a promise that, that um, all those theories, thoughts, ideas that bombard one's mind, we've been given some mighty weapons, some power-filled weapons to annihilate it so that we not only escape it and its annihilation, we get to annihilate it. Have we got weapons? Have we got an ability to access this power? Amen. Yes, we do. Part of these weapons that we have is the nature we have, which is righteousness. And if you care, if you've got it, if, if you've got an instruction to put on, hallelujah, holiness, then, uh, <clears throat> then you've got it to put on. My question is, why is it off in the first place? But if it is off, Put it back on because you've been made the very righteousness of God, Christ Amen. of God. Amen. In Christ Jesus. Notice the words. Put on holiness as the protective armor that covers your heart. Is that important? Yes. Repentance. Put this down. This is so key. Repentance is one of the most powerful things there is. Hallelujah. I'm going to say it again. Repentance is one of the greatest blessings that you can have. The ability to turn, have a total change of heart. Hallelujah. Be completely consecrated and turn from what you have been up to to what God wills you to be up to. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, notice this is sobering. Hear me out. This is your protective clothing. Proverbs 20, 20, 29, verse 1, it says, 29, verse 1, it says, He who is often rebuked or corrected and hardens his neck will suddenly be destroyed, and that without remedy. I'm going to read it from the RSV. He who is often reproved yet stiffens his neck, will suddenly be, uh, be broken beyond healing. One of the most, worst things that can happen to an individual is for them to become unrepentant or hard-hearted. Where, you know, if your heart is hard, you know, you won't repent, 
um, it's like you get to a place where nobody can help you. Yeah. Not even God himself. God can't even help you. Yeah. Um, where, where, and the reason why he can't is because you're not even yielded to him. When he speaks, you're not even yielded. He can't even help you. It's when somebody is corrected, when you know, put, keep it up, when someone is often rebuked, often corrected, like the Lord's dealt with you over and over and over and over again, yet you're, you, you've hardened your neck. Your heart is hardened to this thing. In other words, you're not turning from it. You're not turning away from it. You're just set there. Like God can't even help you. You've chosen your own destiny there. So he wants to protect you, but there's a destroyer who comes around. He's roaming to devour folk. He said it will be sudden destruction without even a remedy. Man, see, I've always got so quiet. <laughs> Someone who refuses to change. There will come a time when destruction strikes swiftly. And no, there's nobody there who can fix it. Does Christians need to repent? Is repentance something that Christians still do? Well, in Revelation, all the churches in, uh, in the book of Revelation, without even turning there, you see, you see God, Jesus, gave each and every one of the churches an opportunity to repent. And then he says in, in Revelation chapter 3, 19, he said, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. <laughs> well, what does it mean to repent? It isn't a casual change of your mind thinking. It's a complete change of heart where you are so regretful for these. I mean, you, it's, all, it's like a godly, can I even use the word, a godly sorrow. It's like a heart-wrenching, uh, Lord, I grieved you. I repent. It's not just a change of mind. You know, okay, I won't do that again. It's, it's from the heart. We see a man, Simon, who was a sorcerer in Acts chapter 8, um, and uh, he heard about Philip, and uh, he heard the things that Philip had preached, and he believed that he became a Christian. He became a believer, the Bible says, in Acts chapter 8. And he saw all the signs, wonders, and miracles, and, and then he pleaded with them, um, Look, I'll, I'll, tell you, I'll give you some money so that I can have the power to do what you're doing so I can lay hands on people and, and see their bodies change and see people getting filled with the Holy Ghost. Like, you're seeing people get filled with the Holy Ghost. And then it says in verse 18, And when Simon saw that through the laying on of hands, laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money. Next verse, look at this. Uh, saying, give me this power also that anyone on whom I lay hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Next verse, look at this. Uh, but Peter said to him, your money perish with you because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. Next verse, look at this. You, neither, you have neither part nor portion in this matter, for your heart is not right in the sight of God. Those whose heart is not right in the sight of the Lord need to repent. What was the key for this guy who was a believer? If you read it, he believed Philip's preaching. He was, he was a believer, but his heart was not right. What was the key for his, his, his fixing up the wrong heart? Repent, therefore. Repentance. Who's hearing me? Hallelujah. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, eight, I'm going to try and close here uh, in, in a few minutes here. It says, uh, godliness is profitable for all things. Woo. Come on, the best of life is not reserved for the devil and the devil's children. The best of life is reserved for God's children. And he said, godliness is profitable for all things. See, in, in Romans chapter 8, hallelujah. Romans chapter 8, verse 32 says, he did not spare his own son but delivered him up for us all. I'm so grateful. How shall he not with him also freely give us all 
things. He said profit, uh, godliness is profitable for all things. See, God spared his son. He, le- he sent his son to die and he allowed, he, so that his son would be tortured for us. See, he gave, tell him, tell him, almost done. Uh, someone's fine. <laughs> um, is there an ice cream truck outside? Is it, is it one of those Sundays where we get ice cream, free ice cream? Maybe next summer. Praise the Lord. What do you think? God gave us Jesus. Amen. He he gave us Jesus, but do you think he, he has a problem? He has a problem giving us that paid vehicle that we need? He gave us Jesus to be bruised for our iniquities and wounded for our transgressions, yet he struggles to give us that paid holiday that we require, that paid position. Come on, does he? I'm going to say again, the best of life is reserved for God's children. What's the key? Godliness is profitable for all things. Woo, shabananias. You know, people who think that way, you know, I mean, okay, yeah, God didn't spare his son, gave us his son to be tortured for us, but man, he has a problem, uh, you know, dealing with, with paying off my mortgage. Do you know what? That is a mindset, a stronghold that is speaking from somebody who has been deceived. Deceived. It's a stronghold in the mind. Come on, he's the writer, Paul is showing us a comparison here. He's saying, come on, look. How much more is he going to sort out all the other stuff? What's the key? Pulling down this stronghold. And holiness, the reason why holiness, hallelujah. Why has it got so quiet in this room? This ought to get us so excited because we're walking holy, right? (laughs) If we're walking to righteousness and holiness, we think, man, yes! A prophet in all areas of my life, amen. Amen. But let the Holy Ghost to do something on the inside of us. Amen. Amen. Oh, glory to God. Hallelujah, Hallelujah Lord Jesus. I'm going, to, I'm, going to read, I'm going to read it. First Timothy chapter 4, verse 8. Godliness is profitable for all things, having promised of the life that now is and of that which is to come. Remember Jesus in Mark 10, 29 to 30, Jesus said, anyone who has given up land, property, father or mother for my sake and the gospel in this life shall receive now, in this life, a hundredfold. Yes, there is a heaven. I've made arrangements to get there. Anyone else made arrangements to get there? I've made arrangements, but the Bible says now in this life. I'm not waiting to, be, to die to be blessed. Do you understand what I'm saying? Things change when when you apply different actions, when you have a complete, some of you need a complete change, of course. You need to completely turn from your wicked ways and walk in holiness and you will watch things in your life will start profiting. All things. All go- when? Like now, he said. Now in this life and in the life which is to come. That waiting mentality needs to be crushed. You can walk holy today. You can walk in your righteousness today. You can attack life today. You can attack that which the Lord has told you to do today. Hearing a minister talk like this, he was, he was saying, you know, uh, he was wondering when, you know, when, you know, people would, would, would invite, invite him onto their radio show or their TV program to preach and share the revelation that the Lord was downloading to him. And he thought, you know, this waiting game, I'm going to quit waiting for people to invite me onto their show. And I'm going to, I'm just going to get my phone out. And I'm going to go on Facebook Live and I'm going to just broadcast what the Spirit of the Lord has given me. And I'm going to broadcast and have my own show show for free (laughs) in my own living room and the and the and the individual seeing seeing the kingdom advance and seeing just mighty things take place bishop oyedepo mighty man of god in in nigeria he said he said there's no such thing as 
waiting for miracles, but there is something called the workings of miracles. Woo! Come on. Don't wait. Not changing. Change your action and see change. Change your actions and see change. Hallelujah. I wonder what would have happened if God would have just sat back and said, man, it's pretty dark around here, isn't it? I wonder when light is going to show up. No, he said, light be. And our next weapon is, is words. Words are our weapon. Holiness is our weapon. Change the action. Come on, someone. Holiness. And I'm not going to go on to weapon number two, but these weapons are mighty. Mighty. Mighty is our God. Mighty is his hand upon us. Who believes his hand is mighty upon you? You just put your hand right on your chest right now. Say, Father, thank you that your hand is upon my life, my family's life, my spouse's life, my church, my business, my work, those I work with, those I do life with. Your hand is mighty upon me. Hallelujah. Come on, praise him. Thank him in your own words. We don't need keys. We don't need anything. Just thank him. Thank you. Mighty is your hand. Mighty is your power. Mighty is your grace. Mighty is your operating power at work in my life today. In the name of Jesus. Not only mighty to save, but mighty to sustain. Oh, glory to God. Mighty to cause increase. Mighty to cause progress. Mighty is my God. Mighty are the weapons I have. Glory to God. Woo, mighty are the weapons. I pull down, slap down strongholds. I pull down, s- slap down strongholds, fortresses that are being built around me to try and trap me and limit me and stop me from moving forward into the things that I've called, I'm called into. Oh, it is being demolished, destroyed. Hallelujah. Holiness. I speak over my own life. I speak over, come on, you do this. You, you, say, you say this. I, I, I'm going to walk upright today. I'm going to walk upright this week. I'm a holy, holy. I've been made holy. I put on my holiness. I'm part of the holy nation. Hallelujah. Zin and I am under. I put, put on the shield. I put on the breastplate of righteousness. Hallelujah. I wear my righteousness this week. Hallelujah, Lord. And I see every area of my life prospering in Jesus' name. Hallelujah, Lord. I tell you the seriousness of this. You go before the Lord today, and you give it time. And you go before him, and you separate yourself from everybody in the house if need be. And you go and you mean it when you say, Lord, I repent, I'm sorry. You mean it. You have a conversation with the Lord. You turn. You repent. And you watch God flood your life. And play catch up and redeem the time. Oh, and restore the lost harvests. Hallelujah, Lord Jesus. Oh, and expedite your prayers in this hour. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. This is a season to walk upright and walk holy. You know it. You know it It always has been. But now it is time. And time is running out. If you know there's an area you must change in. Oh, I'm telling you, you're like, you know, that's me. I must make that. I must make a change in that area. And you've been sniff, stiff necked. Hallelujah. Then the Lord's speaking to you. I tell you what, the destroyer wants to come swiftly to destroy. Um, the, the, the destroyer wants to come swiftly to, to, to destroy where, whereby nothing can be done it's like too late it's like your flesh is dead it's time to walk upright in the name of Jesus hallelujah someone give him praise thank you father thank you father thank you father oh glory 
Jesus, 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 your grace is sufficient. Thank you, Lord. In our weakness, your grace is sufficient for each person here. Thank you, Lord. Yeah, you sustain, you help, you aid, you protect, you keep, you care for each and every one of us in this room. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Yeah, even those territorial spirits won't even dare mess with, with this bunch who understand the authority they have and the ability they have to pull down every manipulative theory, anything that is trying to refute and come against the mindset of Christ we possess on the inside. Father, thank you for the rising up of the church, the glorious church that shall, bro- shall shine brighter than ever before in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Woo! Hallelujah. Glory. 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 Hallelujah, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. I want, to, want us to pray for a very, very dear family uh, that this church is very close to. Uh, and it's a difficult announcement for me to make. But, praise the Lord. Uh, I know time is ticking. Soon and very soon we shall be in heaven. But our dear brother, Gordon Tapner, went to be with the Lord on, two, on Thursday morning. And uh, he was a blessing to me personally to this church. He was the first one to come to me uh, and volunteer his services in um, this church. And uh, he collapsed in early August, uh, having a meal with his family. From spending quite a bit of time with the family, with with the Tabners and speaking to Karen, who, by the way, she sends her love. They may pop in at some point, but and uh, they've said as much, and we'll see them, I'm sure, and we'll give you all the details of his memorial service, which will celebrate his life and his legacy, which is left, which he would want us to, to run and co- keep on running with. But, you know, he, um, he collapsed, and they didn't know exactly what was the reasons behind that, but, you know, it was heart-related. And, um, but, um, you know, he, we were standing in the church... Uh, the, the, those who Karen told was, was standing and, and I came back as you know on, we came back on Sunday and, and uh, I was praying for, for him and we had people over overseas on Monday and, so I couldn't go but on Tuesday I knew my heart I must go and I must go and see him now and so I did and it was just a glorious time just with him you know, just he wasn't necessarily conscious. He didn't look conscious, but he was breathing on his own. And Karen was there, and Rosie, his daughter-in-law, was bedside. And, you know, um, and uh, he he transitioned on Tuesday, Thursday morning, two twenty-five, I believe. And um, and Karen, you know, she said, "We're at peace. The family's at peace." Um, listening to certain things that he said prior to his departure. I believe that he, he knew who was going and he, he just wanted glory. You know, I often think about heaven and, and think about uh, what we know about heaven. And, you know, it's the saving grace that we don't know a lot about heaven. Because if we did, we would all want to be there right now. You know what I mean? One glimpse, one, one taste of, of it. We won't want to come back. I was ready just to get to that body and command life into his, his body. But, you know, the fam, fam, family were at peace. They, they, they heard this phrase. I thought it was quite comical because they were thinking about what is Gordon saying right now, right after he departed. And, um, and they felt he was saying, okay, very well. Okay, very good. He always used to text me, okay, very good. And on, uh, 
<laughs> and on the Thursday, um, I got out of the shower and I, and I heard that phrase. I, heard, I, was thinking, I was praying in the spirit and I heard that same phrase, you know, and it just made me laugh and think of Gordon. But um, he's in the grandstand saying, it's more than okay. And very, very well. Uh, he's in glory. And Karen said to me, she messaged me this morning and she, and we've been in contact with them and we prayed with them. And Brother Ike and Lois was there. Yemi, you were there on Thursday. And, Dr. Yemi was there on Thursday, and many people had gone to visit. And, and um, Karen said this. I'm going to read it. And she won't mind me reading this. It's on my WhatsApp. Let, let me find it here. Praise the Lord. We love him dearly. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Please emphasize to the people don't be sad. Do not sorrow. Tell them, Gordon says, that they've all done a very, they've all done very well. Whoo, Jesus. Whew. She said, don't be sad. Ah! But we're going to miss him. I'm good. We're going to miss him. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Soon and very soon, we're going to see the king. Soon and very soon, we're going to reunite with those loved ones of ours who perhaps have already transitioned. Some may have transitioned prematurely. Some have overstayed their stay. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, that was just a joke. But soon and very soon, we're going to be in glory too. It's like stepping into another room. It's just like, oh, no, he's just gone into the other room right now. He's just exploring now. This is real. The shortest thing you'll ever do is this. The shortest thing you'll ever do is life on earth. The shortest thing you'll ever do is this. It's like a vapor cut in half. It's smaller still. But I want us just for a couple of minutes just to pray for Karen, pray for, uh, of course, Rosie, Michael, the extended family, the grandchildren, stand with them, Sarah and Tom, of course. Father, we want to thank you for the Tabner family. We want to thank you for Karen, Gordon, Sarah, Michael, Tom. Oh, glory to God, Rosie, the whole family. Father, we want to thank you for them, what they've meant to this ministry right from the beginning. Father, thank you for gracing us with the grace that you gave them. Thank you, Father, for empowering us through the supply of the Spirit that you gave unto them. But right now, Lord, we, we're sad because we're going to miss God. But we rejoice knowing that he's in glory with you. But we think about Karen. We think about the family. We think about those who are still here who are standing strong and thank you the Holy Ghost for sustaining them and giving them a joy beyond oh beyond this natural realm thank you for doing that and Lord it's been encouraging to see but we stand in the gap right now and we pray for them and we speak comfort and we speak the blessing over them and we speak we do we call them blessed today we call them blessed for Jesus you said blessed to those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And we pray by your spirit, a tangibility of your comfort. Oh, unlike anything they've seen before in Jesus' name, be experienced each and every one in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. Our realization today and our proclamation today is that life has triumphed over death. That Gordon is absent from the body and therefore he is present. Present with you in paradise. Woo, glory, glory to God. And I pray, Lord, that the family, Karen especially, will find mega comfort in that reality and that hope of the reunion that is soon approaching in Jesus' precious name. Hallelujah, Lord. I just ask that, that we would be patient in, in uh, knowing when the memorial service will be. We'll make sure that we get the announcement out. But we'll celebrate a life of honor, faith, dignity, love, and hope. 
Woo. He was one guy who used to, he would get alongside me. He would encourage me just at the right moments. You understand what I mean? Call me at the right times and uh, message me at the right times and just help me with so many, so many different things. Uh, practically, spiritually, forever remembered in my, my life, in my family's life, in this church, will always remember Mr. Gordon. Mr. Gordon. Hallelujah. What a legend. We love him dearly. Thank you, Father. Well, Pastor, what should I do now? Well, you can message them, reach out to the family, um, take a bit of time, you know, do whatever's on your heart, be it send them a card, flowers. I know Karen would really appreciate your prayers. And um, as a praying woman, she would. Um, but all is well in the Tabna household. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, this week, blessed week. We're, we're not even walking out here sad. Amen. Can we got it? We got the instruction. You don't mess with the tablets. Amen. Don't be sad. Evie, come on up. No. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Exactly. Another message from the Adamosos, Pastor Joseph and Hickmont. Um, they wanted to just express their gratitude and thanks to the church. Of course, we gave everybody an opportunity uh, the other month, you know, as we sent them out. Uh, they're in London just to, to sow into their ministry. And they said, good morning, church family. We wanted to express our thanks and gratitude for seeds and gifts you have sown into our lives. We are truly grateful by your kindness and generosity. May God multiply your seed sown, amen, and cause you to experience a bountiful harvest. Woo, someone say a bountiful harvest. We look forward to seeing you sometime soon. All of our love, Joseph and Hickmon, amen. Wonderful. Why don't you stand up, tell somebody we are on the winning side in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's, until next time, keep on rejoicing. We'll see you at 6 a.m. tomorrow morning for a wonderful time of prayer. Be blessed as you leave. Amen.